You're listening to the Arts in Isolation podcast, brought to you by Asia House. Welcome everybody, this is Juan de Lara, Cultural Manager at Asia House, and I just wanted to highlight that today will be our last podcast of the year. It has been a wonderful experience with our partners, the Baraka Trust, the Altair Trust, and the Alahan Trust for Culture, to share this time with them. It has been magnificent to be able to exercise resilience in a year like 2020, in which we have to overcome all sorts of obstacles. Yet, I believe that we were able to offer a new and thought-provoking digital content. And as a closure for our Converging Paths series 2020, we'll be discussing today the importance and the history of a community that has deeply impacted the development of the modern world, the policies. And for this, we have with us Sarah Stewart, who coaches the Institute of Zoroastrian Studies at SOAS, where she is also the Shapurji Palunji Senior Lecturer in Zoroastrianism. In 2013 and 2016, she was the creator for the famous exhibition, The Everlasting Flame, Zoroastrianism in History and Imagination. And this year, she actually has published a new book, Voices from Zoroastrian Iran, Oral Texts and Testimony. So I want to welcome you, Sarah. It is truly an honor to have you here. And I think the best question to start this conversation is by asking you, who are the Parsis? Is it a religion, an ethnic group, or a social community? Is it the same Parsi as Zoroastrian? Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Juan, for inviting me to join your Arts in Isolation series, podcasts, Asia House, and also thanks to those who supported it and made it possible. It's a wonderful idea and means to communicate with people all over the world. So in answer to your question, who are the Parsis? I would say that they are really at one and the same time an ethno-religious group and a social community, and they largely belong to a, a very distinctive religious tradition. So in India, they would identify as being originally from Iran. And in the wider diaspora, they might, uh, their roots might be India, but then again, they would still think of Iran as their traditionally, historically motherland, if you like. And of course, there are some ethnic Parsis who would not be practicing Zoroastrians, but by and large, they would still know about the Zoroastrian religion. And so I would say that, yes, it's a, uh, it, it is a very distinctive religion. So they're all three of those things that you mentioned. Thank you, Sarah. And I think it's important to clarify to our audience, uh, perhaps your relationship with the Parsi community and what sort of input are we gaining from speaking with you today? I began studying Zoroastrianism some 30 years ago as a student. And it was to India that I used to go and still do to meet Parsis and to do field work. They're wonderfully hospitable people, so that was very easy for me. And there's a substantial community in the UK, so I've been able over the years to go to uh, functions at the Zoroastrian centres here. No, I'm not a Parsi, but I am an outsider looking in. Zoroastrianism traditionally is not a proselytising religion, for example, like Christianity or Islam. People don't go out to convert and bring people into to become Zoroastrian. So uh, in that respect, uh, no, I haven't uh, converted to Zoroastrianism, but I've studied it for many, many years. And perhaps you want to tell us a little bit more about your current role at SOAS and which are the responsibilities of the Institute? Recently, we were the um, the recipients of a wonderful, uh, genera- uh, generous donation from a Parsi, Mr. Shapur Mistri. And so we were able to set up an institute for Zoroastrian studies at SOAS, where we already have, as a result of another generous donation, we have a chair, the Sardoshti Brothers Chair in Zoroastrianism. So between Professor Almut Hintzer, who holds that chair, and myself, we run the institute. And one of the best things about this is the fact we can have, we can offer scholarships. So students, Parsi, Iranians, Zoroastrians, 
and non-Zoroastrians can come to SOAS to study what is, of course, a, um, a rather you know, focused subject that um, might not be able to survive, actually, without that kind of generosity. Thank you, Sarah. And I think this allows us then to move on a little bit towards the nitty gritty of the topic itself. And, and I feel it would be good to know a little bit more about this figure we keep addressing, Zoroaster. Um, what do we know about him? Okay, well, Zoroaster's identity is associated with a very small corpus of texts known as the Garthas, which encapsulate his teachings. The Garthic portion of the Avesta, or Zoroastrian sacred book, consists of 17 hymns and a liturgy known as the Yasna Hapten Haiti. So these hymns were composed in an ancient Iranian language, Avestan, and they probably go back to the second millennium BC, but they were in oral transmission right through probably until the Sasanian period in Iran. So we're looking at um, 2000 years. And when they were finally committed to writing, it was in an alphabet designed for the purpose because by this time the language of Eston was no longer spoken. And the poetic power of these texts, which are at the heart of the Zoroastrian religion um, or Zoroastrian sacred literature can still be appreciated today. So I'm answering your question in this way because we don't have evidence of Zoroaster or Zarathustra to give the Iranian form of his name from this time. So his actual birthplace and date have been a matter uh, for speculation amongst Parsis and Zoroastrians alike with scholars. But scholarly opinion is that he lived in what we now refer to as Central Asia, around 1200 BC. So if their homeland was originally Iran, what's the story of this diaspora, of these movements of people uh, from there to India? Okay, well, by the, by the time of the uh, Arab invasion of Iran in the 7th century, Zoroastrianism had become the state religion of the Sasanian Empire. Uh, so three, the three great Iranian empires, Achaemenid, Parthian and Sasanian, to a greater or lesser, lesser extent, uh, demonstrate from the early Achaemenid period some association with Mazda worship, so worship of the wise lord, the Zoroastrian supreme uh, deity. And uh, after the invasion of Iran, um, I think I think I can best describe it by telling you about a wonderful epic tale, like I say, Sanjan or story of Sanjan, that many Parsis treat as a as a foundational account of their arrival in India, although it is legendary, perhaps even mythical, you could call it. But it recounts the journey of a small band of Zoroastrians who set sail from the port of Hormuz in southern Iran to escape persecution there. So by this time, uh, religious intolerance, the imposition of the dreaded poll tax, the jizya, and in some some places forced conversion meant that life was very difficult for Zoroastrians in Iran. So they set sail and first of all, the story goes, they landed in Diu, a small island in the Gulf of Kambai, where they spent 19 years before setting sail again for the west coast of India and they landed at a, at a place called Sanjan. And we do have archeological evidence from a period around the eighth century that uh, of, of there being a dachma there, a place where bodies were exposed, which is a very the typical way that Zoroastrians dealt with their dead. And so going back to the story on this journey, from Diu to, to Sanjan, they encountered a, a terrible storm at sea, which they survived thanks to their prayers and a promise to establish a Bahram fire. So a Bahram fire is the highest grade of fire established in the fire temple. And they made that vow if they were going to be delivered safely to their destination. So although the Chese is a legendary account, we do know that we know that trade between Zoroastrian Iran and India had taken place 
at least since the Sasanian period. And then after the Arab conquest in the seventh century, Zoroastrians started to leave in greater numbers and settle in India. Migration probably accelerated in the ninth to 10th century uh, AC, which is when, of course, the, the Kase is, is uh, talking about this arrival. And most Parsis in India today live in Mumbai and in, the, in uh, Gujarat, so along that western seaboard where they did originally settle. That's a wonderful foundational story. And I wondered, once the Parsi community arrived to India, how did they actually manage to merge with the Hindu ideology at the time? How did this um, dialogue occur? When uh, when Zoroastrians first arrived in India, the story, this going back to the Qasé and other uh, accounts that have come down through um, in oral tradition to start with, obviously, the story goes that the Hindu Raja at the time, someone called Jadi Rana, summoned the leading priest to explain the religion to him. And in particular, how how he thought the this the newcomers could benefit his kingdom. And at this point, the Mobed, the, the priest, called for a glass of milk into which he put a spoonful of sugar. And he simply explained that the sugar dissolved without making the milk overflow, cause any problems, uh, but it just made it sweeter. So this is a story that Parsis hold. You know, most of them will be able to tell, tell it to you. And various conditions are said to have been imposed on, on the newcomers who were called Parsis or Persians by the king. So they had to stop using Persian as their language. Men were forbidden to carry arms and weddings had to be held in the evening according to local custom. And women were also obliged to adopt Hindu dress, which meant they had to give up their traditional shalwa kameez the Iranian costume and wear the sari. They did this, but to this day, they wear it in a distinctive way. And uh, we have many portraits from the 19th uh, century where one end of the sari is draped over the head, hiding the right ear. And as a result of wearing it in this way, just one earring shows and you can find beautiful single earrings in family collections of jewellery. So that's a very particularly Parsi thing. And then the other thing is, of course, they wear the sacred shirt, which they get with the, along with the cord, the sedra and the kasti, under, um, they wear that sort of next to the skin, the shirt, and women have very decorative ones to wear with the beautiful saris. And that comes down under the top part of the costume, if you like, covering what you normally see as a midriff in Indian women wearing the sari. So they have a lovely sedra coming down underneath. That's such a wonderful analogy, the one of the of the priests. Very elegant. And, and I wonder through your studies whether you have identified that the visual arts of the Parsis um, after they arrived to India bears any specific characteristic? Did they change their way of dressing or did they adopt any specific artistic characteristic or favorite medium? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no, um, we don't have anything by way of Parsi art or really anything we can identify as particularly Parsi art until the the 19th and, and um uh, 18th centuries when as a result of the China trade there was a, a, a rise in, in Parsi wealth and many wealthy entrepreneurs, businessmen ha began to have um, their portraits painted first of all in, in China and would bring back portraits which became part of family collections. So these are very distinctive one, it's a wonderful um, tradition over a couple of centuries of Parsi portraiture, very distinctive looking uh, men and women, and in some cases children. And these portraits today are precious heirlooms and also adorn many of the fire temples in Mumbai. 
So I would say that this is perhaps the most distinct, distinctive collection of art that you would associate with the Parsis, but Parsis generally are, are collectors of art and uh, you can find wonderful paintings in people's houses, but I would say that these are the most distinctively Parsi. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I think we keep referring to fire, to fire worshipping as well. And it would be interesting to get a broader insight on the belief of this community, um, whether you can share with us some information about perhaps their ethos or their structures. I wonder whether the religion itself has something like pillars, some sort of established structure. Well, if you ask a Zoroastrian whether Iranian or Parsi, what are the guiding principles of their religion? You might be told quite simply good thoughts, good words, good deeds. In fact, this, this, this does have an, a doctrinal underpinning. But going a little deeper, I would focus on three main teachings. The first, as you just mentioned, is the centrality of fire, both in priestly ritual and in lay devotional life. So within the domestic, you know, within the household, most Parsis and Iranian Zoroastrians will have a little corner where there is a uh, a candle or a, a, an oil lamp. And then you have the magnificent sacred fires in the dedicated fire chamber within the fire temples. The second, um, the second pillar, as you call it, I think I would say is a, this deep dichotomy between good and evil. And a person is free to choose between the two in their lifetime hence the importance of good thoughts, good words, good deeds, but with an obligation to try and rid the world of evil so that uh, ultimately it will return to its once perfect state at the end of time. Then, so that's a, a universal vision, but at the end of the individual person's life, their soul will be judged according to their good and bad deeds, and this will determine the fate of the soul in the immediate afterlife. And then the third important teaching concerns the story of creation. And so Zoroastrianism teaches that the world was brought into being by the wise Lord Ahura Mazda with the aid of seven divine immortals known as Amish Spenters. And so the seven creations of fire, water, earth, sky, plant, animal and man. And they, as I said, were created in a perfect state only to be attacked and spoiled and polluted by the evil spirit, Angra Mainyu. This is according to the Wunderhishan story of creation. So it's man's duty while on earth to overcome evil in all sorts of different ways. And uh, one of these is to keep the creations pure. So fire and water must be kept unpolluted, the earth unsullied, plants and trees and animals should be nurtured and kept healthy. And in this way, I, Zoroastrianism is known to be the first environmentally friendly religion. And I think we have mentioned this before, but I think in relation to maintaining uh, earth and water and fire and polluted, there, the Zoroastrian and the Parsi communities have very specific funerary rites. Well, uh, traditionally in uh, ancient Iran, the custom was to expose the dead. This was, uh, the, the terrain was rocky and inhospitable, therefore difficult to, to perform a burial, but actually doctrinally, the idea of keeping the earth pure meant that a body would not be consigned to the earth. So the, what are known as the Towers of Silence in Iran, a Dachma in India, often referred to as a Dungawadi. Uh, these circular stone towers were built with a very, um, again, a very environmentally friendly way of disposing of the deceased. So they were taken up into the Dachma and laid on stone tablets in the in the center of the, of the tower. There was a pit in the middle well, there is because they, these Towers of Silence are still in, being used in, in Mumbai and in other parts of uh, India today, in Gujarat and Nasari. 
And so periodically, once the uh, the bodies had been cleaned and by the birds, by vultures, the bones bleached by the sun, they'd be swept into the central pit or well in the center of the dachma, in the center of the tower, and there they would disintegrate and just dissipate via channels, uh, at the end of which was charcoal. So all designed to keep the earth clean and not to pollute fire, of course. And so that was the traditional way, and it was stopped in Iran. Uh, the last one was used in a village called Cham uh, about 35 years ago. And in India, they are still in use, although burial is now, of course, what has to be done in the diaspora, and many Parsis and Zoroastrians would opt for that in any event. And I think there are other ways also that the community um, adopts in order to protect the elements. And I believe that's the use of masks uh, and not to be confused ever with those from COVID. Could you perhaps give us a little bit of information about this and why is this something we can observe in the different artistic production of, of, of the Parsis and Zoroastrians even historically? Absolutely, yes, that's a very good question. So, yes, going right back, uh, it's incumbent upon priests when they're performing a ritual in front of the sacred fire to cover their to cover their nose and mouth in exactly the same way as we wear our masks with COVID. And this priestly the covering is called a padam. And uh, so in in some of the rock uh, paintings in Central Asia, in ancient Sogdia, for example, there's, there are wonderful murals with in front of the sacred fire in um, imperial Iran. Some of the motifs show priests standing in front of the fire, and it's obvious that they're Zoroastrian because they're wearing this mouth covering. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I think we have actually covered uh, very essential aspects of the Parsi and Zoroastrian communities around the world today actually is a very introductory um, conversation. But I think I always like to finalize these discussions with a reflection, particularly on the relevance of the topics we discuss. And I wonder, how is this community thriving today? And and why do you think its preservation is important for humanity nowadays? Well, that's a nice question to end with. There are many reasons, but I, I will choose, I think, just two. I think the, because it's a tiny community, when you think about it globally, probably around 130,000 individuals, so they're also a religious minority wherever they are in the world today and have been for centuries from the time that their homeland, Iran, was invaded. So my first point is it should never be forgotten that the teachings of Zoroastrianism go back millennia and have influenced the religious thought of all the major world religions, including Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And secondly, if we think about the Parsis, as a Zoroastrian lady pointed out to me, though small in numbers, they punch well above their weight. And so they tend to be successful, they're achievers in whatever they set out to do. And known for their success as entrepreneurs, Parsis have a long tradition of philanthropy. So they look after their own communities in terms of schools, hospitals, and so on, but also contribute to the welfare of others and ensure that the religion, its history and its people survive outside the community. So they're not just inward looking. Um, for example, the teaching of Zoroastrianism at SOAS, as I mentioned earlier, is thanks to two major donations. So on both these counts and many others beside, I would say that the world would be a much poorer place without the Parsis. Sarah, that's a wonderful way to conclude our talk today and I really thank you for sharing all your input, your knowledge and your passion on the subject with us today and I hope that we are able at some point to meet each other 
and hopefully we can do some more events with you in the upcoming year. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for giving me this opportunity. I hope very much we can have a collaborative event in the future. And of course, thank you very much to all of you who have been accompanying us in this year 2020 for our podcast series. And I do ask you to stay in touch and stay tuned because there will be much more content to be announced at the beginning of 2021. I wish you all a happy festive season and of course a happy new year celebrations and look forward to reconnecting with you after the first week of January. Take care, stay well and have wonderful holidays. You were listening to the Arts in Isolation podcast, brought to you by Asia House. For more information, please visit our website, asiahousearts.org.